Okay, are we live? Is it Tuesday at 2 p.m.? Is this the Rom Toronto uh, Instagram account? I think so, and I'm excited to say it's another episode of the Rom Kid Show. Over the next sort of 30 minutes, we're going to hang out with our good friend, educator and science communicator, Julie Tomei, to talk all about the dawn of life, the origins of life. And uh, hey, we're also going to make a trilobite stamp out of a potato, and we're going to talk about the ROM's upcoming permanent exhibition all about uh, the dawn of life, which uh, frankly has been taking uh, decades to make, and we're finally at the finish line. Uh, we'll show you some advanced sneak peeks of the exhibit and what to expect when hopefully we can all visit the museum again come the fall. Uh, if you're a first time with us, welcome. This is like a kids distance learning program uh, hosted by the Royal Ontario Museum. I'm Kieran Mukherjee. I run the camps at the ROM and this is our way of staying connected. If you're a long time viewer watching from your kitchen, hello, hello, hello. Great to have you back here today uh, talking all about the dawn of life, evolution, animals, uh, potatoes, stamps, trial bites. It is trial bite Tuesday. Uh, if you're tuning in from school or from virtual school, also nice to see you back here as well. Hello, hello. Make sure to drop your questions for our guest Julie Tomei in the chat. Um, all about sort of the evolutions of life, the origins of life, um, and really sort of making a brand new exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum. All of our episodes are obviously live Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on Instagram and it'll be up on YouTube later this week. I feel ready. I think this time has come to do uh, the theme song portion of the event and get this thing started. Welcome to the Rom Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the Rom Kids Show starring you and me. There we go, it's the theme song portion of the event. I feel like I've botched the song a number of times recently, and that one felt really good. Felt really, really good. Moving over to the art table. Uh, I don't have special socks for this one, so I'm just wearing dinosaur socks today. Uh, but really, I should maybe invest in some Dawn of Life, some Cambrian era, Cambrian era explosion socks. I think that'd be really cool. All right, today on the show, we are making Trilobite potato stamps. Uh, they look a lot more appetizing when they're not covered in paint like that, but you know what, we're not eating them, so it's fine. So what do you need to make your trilobite potato stamp? You need a potato, all right? You know, bigger, sometimes is cool. Uh, it gives you more space to work with. So you need yourself a potato. You need yourself a knife. We're using a butter knife because we you know we are pr prioritizing safety. Uh, this is definitely an activity you need a trusted adult to be around working with you on this to make sure it is done safely. And again, we are using a butter knife. Uh, let's be safe with this, uh, but still a very common project that we love. Uh, then you're going to need some paint. I have Viridian Green. You can use whatever you want. You can use multiple different paints. Um, you're going to need a brush. You're going to need a page to you know do your stamps with. And then finally, a little blunt object. I have like this pencil right here, this mechanical pencil, uh, so that we can draw your shape first into your potato. But before we get started, it's time to bring on our very special guest for the third time uh, appearing on the show, science communicator and educator, Julie Tomei. Welcome to the show. Hi. This is so So exciting. great to be back. Oh man, Julie Tomei is one of our favorite guests. Uh, if you go up onto the YouTube, just Google ROM at home and like ROM Kids Show, and you'll find a great episode with Julie Tomei where we talk about constellations. That was a lot of fun. But my mm -hmm. one of my favorite episodes this show has ever done was when you were on a few months ago talking about the Lunar Gateway um, and everything yes. that's going on with the moon. Check those episodes out. Before we get started talking about, you know, what's going on in that picture behind your head right there and all these other really cool things, let's do our first step. So I'm not going to cut this potato because I actually want to make potato chips out of this, but just cut that potato safely and then you're going to end up with your half potato. All right. At this point, what I found was really useful 
is sort of sketch out your animal. Now, what is a trilobite? Oh, let's let's do a question that we didn't even prepare for. Can you describe sure. a trilobite for us? All right. So trilobite, it, the name itself means that there's three lobes of the body. So there's uh, a central lump and then two side lumps, basically. They are super cool, very diverse. Um, Extremely. They were around for a really long time. And like in any sort of fossil collection, you're bound to see a ton of trilobites. One of our old curators, Dave Rudkin, loves uh, trilobites. And I like to give him credit for inventing Trilobite Tuesday, which is a trending hashtag on Twitter. Uh, of people sharing pics of I trilobites. think that's credit where credit's due. Yeah, I think that's fair. So there you go. That's what a trilobite looks like. Um, they're really, really cool, super diverse, and frankly, they're a shape that's pretty easy to make. So what I'm going to do is with my pencil, I'm just going to sort of like jagged out um, the shape of, of my trilobite, all right? So you can see how I'm just sort of like lightly cutting in. That allows me to like make my better cuts later. So draw your shape with your pencil. Um, but JT, Julie Tomei, yep. let's get started. Dawn of life. Can you tell us like when this dawn of life happened? Um, so like when life appeared on earth? Yeah, when did that happen? Yeah. So we're going like way back in time. Um, so the earth is about four and a half billion years old and it would have happened about a billion years into the history of our planet. So three and a half billion years ago, the very first little living things, uh, came to be. Whoa, that is shockingly a lot longer ago than even <laughs> I thought. What did the world look like back then? All right, so let's let's pretend we've got a time machine. We're gonna go on our time machine, go back three and a half billion years. Uh, better bring some respirators with us because first of all, the atmosphere was nothing like it is today. That mix of gases, that envelope of, of what we call air around the earth, it was mostly volcanic gases. So we wouldn't be able to breathe that stuff. And there was nothing on land yet. So it's basically like a lot of rocky land and a lot of ocean and an atmosphere that is poisonous to us. So we definitely couldn't like you life as we know it with us wouldn't be able to survive back then. Um, no way. And I feel like water played a really important role in life. And we talk about water a lot on the show. Check out our water equity episode, which was super awesome uh, a couple weeks ago. Why was why is water like so important? All right, so water is really good at dissolving things, right? So if you think like you put, for example, a, a spoonful of sugar in water, you stir and it looks like the sugar's disappeared, but really it's broken down into smaller bits of sugar and it's all mixed in with the water. Um, and water is really good at dissolving all sorts of things. And so it's really important in the chemistry that happens inside cells. So it allows molecules to break apart those bits to move around and come together with other molecules to make new stuff. Miss White's class is here. Welcome. Nice to see you again. I know you folks always have a ton of questions. We're talking about the dawn of life and sort of evolution and how we sort of got here. So feel free to drop those questions in there. Um, okay, water's important. Um, we know what the world looks like, very different than today. It's not something that we could just breathe in where did life and this is a i think a really complicated question but where did life first evolve do we know i don't considering most of the rocks on on the earth are underwater like True. i don't think we'll ever know the exact spot that like this is where life started but i can tell you that the oldest fossil that's going to be in the gallery is of um, some fossilized little tubes that were probably made by bacteria. And that uh, comes from a place in Quebec. And I will find the name because it is not a name I am super familiar with. Hold on, give me a second, I will find it. Yeah, we were just talking about this name right beforehand too. <laughs> I know, it's Inukjuak, Quebec. Um, okay. So that's, that's one spot on the earth uh, that we find these really, really old rocks with fossil evidence of life. 
Huh, okay, so you know, Canada right in there. All right, so the next thing you're gonna do with your sort of potato stamp, if you're doing the potato stamp activity with us, is you're gonna sort of cut it out. I've sort of gestured sort of vaguely at what I'm trying to make right here, uh, this trial bite almost mushroom shape. I'm then gonna cut out around it uh, so that I leave just the stamp on top, okay? So I'm gonna cut out around it so that we get just our little stamp, okay? And then you got like a little stamp user. You can stamp stuff with it. Okay, what this is, this is, what I think is so interesting about like the Cambrian explosion and the dawn of life was just how diverse it was. So can you walk us through, We you gave me three examples of what life looks like. Can you walk us through our first one, which is stromatolites? Sure. Um, before I get to that, I do want to say that life was like super uh, tiny for a really long time, right? You've mentioned the Cambrian explosion a few times, and that's a few hundred, like 500 million years ago. So there's several billion years there where it's just like little bacteria-like things swimming around. That's so and important. Then, okay, I didn't even think about that. So for, for yeah. most of life, for most of life being around, it was tiny, tiny, tiny. Tiny, 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 microscopic single cells okay then things start gathering okay so and you had asked me for some animals but i threw in the stromatolite which is not an animal um but um because we hadn't even gotten in uh, time yet to anything that we could define as an animal but there are these little um cells that do photosynthesis huh. right so taking water and uh, carbon dioxide and using the energy from the sun and turning it into oxygen and food, right? And so stromatolites are layered, they look like cones and they're just layered because there would have been this layer of cyanobacteria that then because it's underwater, right? Sediment, sand and mud go on top of it, but these things need light to survive. So they kind of go up and make a new layer and then more stuff goes on top and they go up and make a new layer. So you get this sandwich of cyanobacteria and and dirt um, and eventually it hardens and kind of these, these cones. But what's so important about stromatolites is that these are, these are things that are producing oxygen, right? Yeah. So they're so important in introducing this gas into the atmosphere that we can't live without. Oh, so stromatolites sort of help give us the ability to also have life. Yeah. Huh. I mean, it, it changed the conditions. It changed the conditions of the planet that led to what we know today. That was awesome. That's a really good uh, example to have brought up. I really like that. Okay, our next one, and we have some questions here um, for, uh, uh, we have some questions here about Ontario fossils, which we'll get to in a little bit. But what's our next, um, our next example? I can't even pronounce the word. It's meta something. <laughs> Metasphragina. So this is uh, one of the fossils that come from the Burgess Shale. Um, and that's the picture that I chose from my background, right? This is um, one of the quarries that um, paleontologists from the ROM have visited. You can see they're literally working on the side of a mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, and Metasprogena is a little fish. It's a very early fish. Um, it's got its eyes at the top of its head, which I guess is good for making sure you can keep track of what's above you. Um, and there's going to be in the gallery a little school of these guys swimming above your heads at one point, which I can't wait to see. Um, and um, they, there were no jaws yet. Like hmm. this, this is how we're going. They were jawless. But they, they had these little um, things where, you know, they were, they were um, associated with the gills. One of them was a little bit bigger. And so that is possibly the beginnings of jaws. Hmm. So wait, how did this animal eat then? Um, you know, didn't chew. Didn't chew, huh? So, so there you go. That's like an evolutionary thing. Like that, the, the single act of us like crunching on a chip, like it had to begin somewhere. Yeah. I mean, there are still things that are jawless today, right? If you think, if you look at a, a lamprey, huh. that's a jawless fish. Whoa, that is a okay, good reference and nice bloodsucker deep cut right there. Um, and again, this is 
So I'm just showing that picture that we have here. They look really cool and there's gonna be an entire display uh, hanging above your head where you can see these. That's really, really cool. We're excited. And you're gonna see some more pics of the exhibit coming up. Okay, and what's our final example? Uh, I like the Dunkleosteus. It's a really big, you see, you know, so we're, we're, jump, we're doing big bounds in time board between these examples. So the Dunkleosteus is uh, the largest of the placoderms, which were fish that were armored. Their head and their chests were armored. They didn't have teeth, but the edge of their jaws were like knives. They had huge, um, uh, powerful jaws, more powerful than a great white shark. That's, and here we go. We got a, a picture of JT right here with, how do you pronounce the name? Dunkel Osteus. So you mentioned Dave Rudkin earlier. He's the one who told me it's Dunkel Osteus. A lot of people say Dunkley Osteus. He's like, no, it's Dunkel Osteus because it was named after Mr. Dunkel. Yeah, makes sense. That tracks. Okay. Um, these are all really like very diverse animals. We got really small ones. We got really big ones, all sorts of things. Um, where did all this life go? Um, so I, I, we, most people know about the extinction of the dinosaurs, right? Yeah. We know there was a big extinction event then. That's not the only extinction event that there was in the history of our planet. Um, so throughout the new exhibition, there will be representations of those extinction events. So an extinction event is when most of life gets wiped out in a relatively quick amount of time. Um, and we're talking like geological time scales, right? So it's not like they disappear in a year, but in you know many thousands of years, that's really fast in the history uh, of Earth. Um, but at every one of these extinction events, some life managed to survive and then take advantage of the space that was left behind and repopulate the planet. Because, hmm. you know, life finds a way. Life finds a way. I was waiting for you to do that. That's a really good <laughs> one. Life does find a way. Um, we got audible laughing here. Um, Okay, um, I think what what's a really important thing to sort of riff on here is often when we think about paleontology, we think about dinosaurs. But yes. paleontology covers a lot of other things. This is an example of an, another type of paleontology studying all these animals before the dinosaurs. Um, okay, we've had some questions in the chat about um, Ontario and fossils. So from from our chat, from 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 the chat, we want to know what's the oldest fossil that we found in Ontario. Do we know this one might be a tough one? That's one that I don't know off the top of my head, but I can tell you that fossils in Ontario, the rocks in Ontario are older than uh, rocks that you would find dinosaurs in. So you're looking at rocks from uh, the Devonian, the Silurian, and the What's the third one? Ordovician. Yeah. Okay, and we talk a um, lot about on this show too that there are like, there's not really dinosaurs that we can find in Ontario, but there are fossils in Ontario. Absolutely. Um, I'd say the most common fossils, you're gonna find trilobites. Um, you're gonna find brachiopods aplenty. Brachiopods are uh, similar to clams, right? Things that have two shells. Um, you're going to find solitary co corals, uh, which look like, they look like little horns. And, um, and a lot of crinoids as well. Last summer we were camping, my family, we brought a, uh, one of my daughter's friends with us. We were camping at Darlington Provincial Park, which is just uh, um, on the, lake, uh, the shores of Lake Ontario. And uh, my daughter's friend was like, hey, Julie, what's this? And she had just a small black rock with some little gray circles in it. And I was like, oh, you found a fossil. And crinoids were things that look like tulips, but they were animals. And their stalk is made up of these little discs all piled up on top of one another. When they die, they tend to fall apart. So you get lots of little circles in the in the rock. Um, and she was so excited. She's still talking about it now, like I, seven months later. I would love to go like hiking with an like with Julie Tomei because I I would learn <laughs> so much. So if you want to go find fossils in Ontario, dinosaur ones sort of out of the out of the question right now, but you certainly can. There's trilobites out there. There's lots of different 
um, animals. So I'm really excited about that. You can start your fossil collection. Um, okay, what I want to talk about now is the exhibit. This is really important. Um, we have been working, how long have we been trying to make this exhibit? You know, I don't even know. It's been decades. This particular iteration, the funding was announced in November of uh, 2018. So it'll be three years from that announcement to the opening. Uh, but it, it started uh, a number of times the planning for this exhibition and started at least two or three times before this one. I like right now you everyone getting a sneak peek of what this exhibit looks like. Uh, I don't I don't really think the ROM has done this kind of like access to these images. So we're pretty, pretty excited about it. Um, this what is can you say something about this exhibit while I flip through these images, something about this exhibit that you're really excited about? Uh, well, first of all, I'm really excited that it's going to exist. Um, <laughs> like yeah, no it's doubt. been it's been so long coming, and in the in the time that I've worked at the ROM, I've I've taught myself evolution so that I could teach the evolution course that we used to do, and I would spend like twenty minutes in front of the Futalankasaurus just introducing the Dawn of Life preview gallery because it was it was great. It had a lot of good stuff in it, but it was too small to teach in, right? I'm so excited to have a space that I'll be able to bring a class, sit them down, talk about what I want to talk about in front of the thing that I'm going to talk that I want to talk about rather than doing a lot of hand waving. This it's a it's a beautiful exhibit. It's full of lots of color. If you go to ROM camp, um, you will know this as Bronfman Hall, which was that big giant white open room. If you go a little bit farther back in time, this is where the old dinosaur gallery was. Yep. Um, so, you know, a lot of history with a lot of different things. Then one thing that we were talking about in the pre-interview when we were getting ready, is there something kind of exciting about, the exhi about this exhibit that's also like kind of progressive as well. And it's in the way that we're naming um, the different areas and locations where these fossils came from. Can you sort of tell us what that is and why that's important? Yeah, so, I mean, we're talking about the earth as it was a really long time ago, and that comes before people. So it comes before the place names that we use for places today. So it's given us a great opportunity to do some of that decolonization of the museum that um, that we keep talking about and working towards. So rather than having, you know, the, the political name of a place and then the indigenous name in brackets, it's gonna go the other way around. So you're gonna have the indigenous name and as much as possible an origin for that name, a meaning for that word. And then the, you know, the maybe better known political name in brackets. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that um, because it it is an important step and it is the first big gallery that we've done since we've made those commitments. That's really, really important. Always try and find a way to like work an indigenous perspective into what you're doing, um, as well as like some sort of decolonial practice. That would be really, really good. Um, okay, we do have a question from the chat. What kind of fossils mm -hmm. can we find um, around Thunder Bay or like Lake Superior? Mm. Um, again, not, not so, I wish, I wish I had an expertise in like every area, uh, but probably similar to the things I named earlier, mm -hmm. you know, your trilobites, your, your crinoids and, and brachiopods. Um, yeah. Cool. I like that. That's a pretty good one. Okay. We're now going to go, we have a few more questions. Um, I'm now going to paint my stamp. All right. Now I think my stamp I made yesterday was better. Uh, it was a little bit bigger and frankly, I was a little bit less nervous when I was doing it because I was trying to hold a conversation at the same time. Uh, but what you can do is you can make like a little plate uh, where you can put your paint on or you can just put your paint like directly on to your print and then you're going to use your brush to fill it all in and then you're going to have your stamp. Okay, so I'm going to do that right now, but we did have another question from our group. This is a big question and I think it's like very sort of specific to who you are. But what do you think is the most important fossil ever found? Oh my. That's a hard one. That's a really, really hard that one. That is a tough one. Oh, it's so hard to choose. 
I'm I'm a big fan of the stromatolites, like we, we mentioned earlier. They're not super interesting to look at, but for what they mean for the history of our planet and the history of evolution and life on our planet, they're just so cool. I like that. I like that. Okay, we do have like a, is it, I'm going to try and say this word right. Pika. 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 Pikaya? Pikaya. Pikaya. There you go. Thank you for picking that up. That was hard for me. <laughs> yeah, Pikaya is really cool too. Um, there's definitely going to be some in there. Um, you know, Jean ba Dr. Jean Bernard Caron is a world expert on the bird of shale, and he's been at the ROM for over a decade now, uh, doing doing trips out to the bird of shale every summer, except last summer because stuff. Um, and Pikaya is really cool because it's this little wormy thing, but it has a nautocord in it. And that's a, a little tube that um, in in later organisms and in our cells, if you look at, at like developing embryos, they start by having a notochord and that becomes um, the, the spinal cord and the spinal column. So uh, Pakaya is like our great, 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 <laughs> put in another, another bunch of greats you know, ancestor there. Um, so yeah, the Burgess shale are super interesting because there's relatives, ancient relatives of every group of animals still around today represented. Whoa, in those that's awesome. I just, you know, life's really come a, a long way to get to us today <laughs> talking over Zoom. Um, okay, we, I guess one of the final things I want to know is, you know, once we can go back outside and do things again, this exhibit is opening pretty soon. When when can we actually learn about all this stuff at the ROM? November. That's so soon, everyone. November. So soon. I think that's a, a great reward for us, like getting through all of this, is to be able to learn about the dawn of life. Um, folks, we had a lot of fun today with I think one of our favorite guests, Julie Tomei. Hey. That's my potato stamp. It worked out all right. And what I did too is I put some lines down the middle that sort of talk about like all the different ridges that are in a trilobite. But really, you can do any simple shape with a potato. Um, we learned all about the dawn, the dawn of life. It began in water. It began a really long time ago. We know that for most of life on Earth, it was microscopic. Uh, not flying around in planes like we do today, but really, really, really <laughs> small. Then... We had the Cambrian explosion where just life started to diversify and all sorts of other like shapes started to take place. At some point we had to learn how to grow a jaw. That was a thing that happened. Um, we know that one of the oldest fossils, if not the oldest fossil is found in what is today Quebec, which is really cool. We know that there are fossils in Ontario that you can find um, from this time as well, from before the time of dinosaurs. Paleontology, as much as I love it, is not just dinosaurs. It's about all different sorts of life that took, uh, took place in the past. And of course, we learned that the ROM has, frankly, one of the most exciting things to happen to it in a really long time, a permanent gallery that will be one of the best in the world, all about the dawn of life. And I can say uh, very confidently that we have one of the best teams that study uh, invertebrate paleontology at the ROM, and it's going to be a fascinating exhibit that I'm sure like Julie and I both can't wait to teach in. It's gonna be so, so much fun. And with that, thanks everyone. We had a lot of fun. Julie Tomei, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, next week, Kaya Costa will be on to talk about the role of climate change and rising temperatures and how that disproportionately uh, harms uh, indigenous coastal communities. And we're going to do some science experiments to talk about it. So another really big, important episode next week. Uh, see you on Instagram then. See you on YouTube. Uh, been great having you. Stay safe. We love you. Wear a mask. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye, friends.